it's no secret that over time, the value of a dollar has varied dramatically. And not just in the past few decades have prices changed. According to data given by the US Department of Labor, Bureau of Statistics, a whole chicken costs an average of $1.42 per pound in January 2017. The cost of that identical chicken increased by 9 cents or 6.3% in January 2018. The pace of price growth for goods and services in an economy over a predetermined time period is known as inflation. Naturally, fewer things may be obtained since each unit of cash loses buying power as items prices grow. The Consumer Price Index or CPI, a measure created by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that takes into account pricing information for thousands of commodities across the nation, is the main method used in the United States to track inflation. The BBC provided the following explanation of how the CPI aids in our understanding of inflation and prices change. If CPI is 3%, this implies that on average, the price of goods and services we purchase is 3% more than it was a year ago. So to put it another way, we would have to pay 3% more to buy the same products we did a year ago. Instead, there is a phenomenon known as deflation, which is when prices drop because there are more things available than there is money in circulation to acquire them. Although a decline in prices in budget land sounds like a dream, deflation is also actively watched and halted in its tracks since it has been shown to enhance the chance of a depression or a recession. The first occurs when government increases money printing. Governments frequently take this action to boost the economy and add jobs. Increasing government debt or printing more actual money or are two ways to increase the amount in circulation. During the American Civil War, the Confederate created $20 million in treasury notes as a real-world illustration of how printing more money may increase inflation. To go back a little bit, one gold dollar cost one confederate dollar when the conflict first broke out in 1861. The inflation rate increased from 5% to 5% in just 4 months and from 5% to a staggering 140% by 1863. The average inflation rate in modern times is between 2 and 3% each year. Yet, what occurred throughout this time period is an example of hyperinflation, or inflation that escalating rapidly. Cost push inflation is a different sort of inflation. As a company's operating expenses increase, consumers must pay more to support the company's continued operation. The causes of increased business maintenance costs vary, but there are many of them. For example, sometimes the price of the supplies a company requires goes up. Employees want more pay or land rental rise. Demand pull inflation or when more people desire a commodity or service but the supply isn't growing at the same rate is the last reason for inflation. This occasionally occurs when individuals become affluent and have more disposable income. With the government lower taxes, consumers could have more money to spend on goods and services, which could result in this kind of inflation. So who is responsible for preventing inflation from being overly inflated? These dependable brains are employed by the Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank, whose primary goals are to regulate inflation and avert a recession. According to the website of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, 80% of the 6,000 banks in the country are members of holding companies, giving the reserve a window into the financial health of the nation as a whole. The reserve also has a significant influence over the state of the country's smaller banks. The Reserve Bank of India, the Bank of England, 
in the Swiss National Bank, to mention a few, are a few additional nations that have central banks. The Balance.com's post from June 2019 outlined the numerous ways the American Federal Reserve contributes to inflation management. One way is by the application of contractionary monetary policy, which compels a cutback in public expenditure, particularly deficit spending. Governments implement deficit spending in an effort to promote economic expansion. For instance, this money would be spent on buildings and medical supplies that would later house enterprises that would employ people. Open market operations, or when the reserve sells securities in the form of treasury notes from member banks, are another method the reserve might use to pursue a contractionary monetary policy. Banks are required to purchase these assets once the reserve sell them, which lowers their capital and limits the amount of money they can lend to customers. Higher loan interest rates are the end outcome of this. The series of occurrences that make up open market activities aid in reducing economic growth and controlling inflation. The reserve can also increase the amount of cash that banks must have on hand at the end of each day, which further restricts the flow of money into the economy. The reserve may also increase the fee it charges banks to borrow money in order to ensure that they have enough reserves before each day's end. The reserve also controls inflation through the use of liquidity or the degree to which money is readily available for investment or consumption, in addition to contractionary monetary policy. This would increase the cost of taking out a loan for individuals. You deserve a hearty congratulations for keeping up with that difficult economics lecture. Unfortunately, according to Ben Bernanke, a former chairman of the bank, this approach has little to do with the most effective instrument for containing inflation. He said that the most crucial thing is to prevent the people from anticipating inflation and then purchasing more items at a reduced price, as this might also produce inflation. In this sense, he contended it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When discussing something as tangible as money, a cosmic theory makes sense. The process of inflation in the United States has been described in detail thus far, but hyperinflation, which occurs when monthly inflation jumps by 50% or more, has historically occurred around the world, frequently with fatal results. Our most recent illustration of this is Venezuela and its enormous economic problems. The Civil War had the highest inflation rate that we have so far discussed. It is insignificant when compared to Venezuela, where the central bank estimates that between April 2016 and 2019, the country's inflation rate rose by 53,798,500. We may use coffee to more clearly describe what life has been like for Venezuelans during the unrest. The average cost of a cup of coffee has increased to more than 2 million boulevards at the time of a Forbes article about Venezuela's hyperinflation in August 2018. It would amount to more than 10 US dollars for just one cup of coffee. You may feel like you overpaid for coffee one morning, but in Venezuela, this is the standard and not an aberration. In addition, the coffee cost 1,400 boulevards the week before the story and 1,900 that April. Venezuela's hyperinflation is a symptom of a much wider and ostensibly interactable economic catastrophe. Venezuela, which was formerly well known for its abundant oil deposits, once ported prosperity and stability. Oil prices increased in 1999 giving the government more money to spend when Hugo Chavez was elected president. Then, the Petróleos de Valenzuela workers strike, 
which lasted from December 2002 to February 2003, had a significant impact on the economy. During the first few months of 2003, the gross domestic product or the monetary worth of what a nation produces plummeted by 27%. Chavez made an effort to stem the Bolivar's value decline, but it just created additional issues. According to Forbes, following the strike, there was a currency peg, import restrictions, subsidies for food and consumer goods, all of which created the conditions for future inflation to occur inevitably. Now, with stores lacking the necessities and black market prices rising, Venezuelans are still primarily dependent on the government for their commodities and services, and things are still not looking good. The official website of the International Monetary Fund reports that as of the start of 2020, in the drafting of this screenplay, the inflation rate is 500,000. Zimbabwe provides another illustration of how ludicrous and unmanageable inflation has historically played out. While being located almost 7,000 miles away, the late 1990s saw the introduction of land reforms, some of which resulted in land redistribution from white farmers to black ones which is when Zimbabwe's unrest began. They were unable to generate the appropriate quantity of food since they lacked the experience to manage these new farms. The country's president at that time, Robert Mugabe, observed that people were hungry in the streets and that the economy of his nation was in disarray in the year 2000. The primary reason the government felt obligated to create additional money was the ongoing war with the Congo, which required more to pay the soldiers. Yet, there were other variables that also played a role, including as an excessive amount of national debt, a lack of productivity, and a general loss of confidence in the Zimbabwean leadership. Now, on to Mugabe. The absurdly large sums of money weren't being invested effectively, which prevented enough new items from being produced and reduced their purchasing power. It's difficult to imagine that such extreme inflation occurred over the course of the following eight years, but it did. Prices increased by 112% annually by 2001. It soared to 1,218% annually by 2006. To more of these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. See you next time!